Okay, we're good to go. Okay, uh, go All ahead right. and start sharing. Yeah, and again, I see the, this uh, is slides. We can uh, see yep, that. you're good. Cool. Uh, St. Francis University, SFU, and the Stratosphere experiences of a new stratospheric ballooning team. With that, take it away. All right. So hi everyone, my name is Hugh Flanagan. I am a senior general engineering student at St. Francis University with a concentration in aeronautics. So really what I wanna do here is spend a few minutes talking about the team and then a few minutes talking about some of our payload development beyond what we were sent by Montana. So SFU and the Stratosphere began around March of 2023. Before that, none of us had ever even really considered what a weather balloon was or what a annular eclipse could look like. So I really want to highlight how we went from knowing nothing to trying to redesign stuff in just eight months. So I'll be presenting, and then Brother Marius Strom is also on the call, and if I miss anything, I'll ask him to see if he has anything to add at the end. So... Like I mentioned, we got started really in the spring semester of 2023. So that picture on the left, you see some of our team members in the front is uh, Abby Mehan and Nicole Himes. We were playing with just some party balloons, trying to do some introductory tests of, okay, what can we expect with kind of payload weights, uh, ratios of how much helium we think we're putting in to how many paper clips we can lift, kind of basic stuff that gave us the idea of, okay, what are we really doing with this project? Um, flash forward a little bit. This second picture is us over the summer. We earned a couple of research grants from our university office of student research. And this is some of our students working on the ground station. And there we have, let me just move you guys over. Yeah, we have three of our students that were trying to set up that ground station, took us quite a few attempts to get it to work right. And we need to check it again to make sure it still is. But that was really a primary focus was, okay, over the summer period, how can we prepare ourselves for this annular eclipse in October? So we were able to learn from our peers. So in May of 2023, the University of Maryland invited several schools from the southeast pod of the NEBP to come visit and kind of learn the basics of ballooning, almost like a ballooning boot camp. And that picture on the left is our crew that went down there from Loretto, Pennsylvania. And behind us is the balloon, either, I think it was the Snoopy balloon, I may be corrected later, that University of Maryland launched. So that was really a great experience because before that was the first time we had ever seen the balloon launch in person. The picture in the middle is a dry run we did. So those are some of our self-developed payloads later that summer in our science center building. Um, it's got a nice atrium with three separate levels. So we were able to rig up a little pulley system and have brother Marius at the top pulling up payloads, pretending to be a balloon so we could kind of get a feel for what a launch might look like while we were inside. And then at the top right, that was our first successful launch in Pennsylvania. On the left is um, three of the University of Maryland students that came up to help us. So huge shout out to the University of Maryland again. We really learned all of our basics about balloon launching from that group. So over that six week period, six week period over the summer, we launched three times. The first launch, SFU in the Stratosphere 001, we launched from Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania of Punxsutawney Phil Groundhog Day fame. Um, so we have us underneath the balloon launch tarp inflating or just starting to inflate. And then at the bottom is our group picture after the launch. And then we had our second launch, which is from our campus. That's on our campus soccer field. And you can see all the trees. That recovery was an exciting one, but we did get it out of the tree. That was us after that recovery. You can tell we were a little tired and excited, but it was a good time. And then our third launch, we actually went back to Punxsutawney and were able to launch almost no winds. We nearly went straight up and that one actually landed on a set of power lines. So we had to call uh, Penelac to come safely remove it from the power lines for us. So we have a bit of a history of exciting landings from our launches. So our first launch during the semester was our practice launch before 
the um, before the annular eclipse. So that launch, we actually had our first successful use of the venting system. Um, you can see on that figure that our ascent rate decreases to a very nice flat line, approximately one meter per second. Unfortunately, it landed in a tree on a privately owned hunting preserve, and it took us over a week and several rainstorms to get the stuff out. So that was a period of stress for a lot of the team members, myself and brother Marius, probably more than most, um, where we were trying to figure out once we got out of the tree, okay, can we recover this? How much do we need to you know, call Montana and say, hey, we need a new pterodactyl or we need a new iridium. Fortunately, we didn't need totally new versions of either. So we got lucky, but that was certainly a sobering launch experience where it was, okay, can we really expect to get this done in a safe and functional way this early or this close to an eclipse? However, our annular eclipse really went quite well. So we went to Capitan, New Mexico. We launched uh, in the parking lot of St. Jude's Catholic Church in San Patricio, New Mexico. Um, the only issue we had was that uh, communications loss led to an overvent. So we did not reach our target altitude, but we did get good data and we are currently processing it. So we are excited to share our results when that's done. So moving on to some of the payload development. Our first payload that we're trying to kind of figure out, we're calling it the Rescue Ranger. It's a payload recovery assistance device. Essentially, it's extra rope in a box. So the idea is, if we have rope that's retained in a safe way, so it's ideally not going to fall out in flight, and we do plenty of shake testing to avoid a sudden increase in flight line length, can we have it, if it's hanging in a tree via remote control, drop extra rope so we can just pull it out, not have to worry about getting a tree climber, not have to worry about, you know, trying to get a recovery pull up when there's no chance of getting a 30 foot recovery pull up to a 60 foot high payload. So really trying to work with what we've got and come up with a way to mitigate those tree landings because in Pennsylvania, especially Western Pennsylvania, it's a very high likelihood. So this payload I know the most about because I worked on it more than most of the other students. So we have some of the components labeled in here. Our next payload that we wanted to work on, this is more of the scientific side of things. We wanted to try and create a thermoelectric generator. Now, in an ideal world, we would use this TEG to power some of our payloads in on during the flight. Um, in theory, this payload would create a bit of a greenhouse effect on the interior with some of the dark components on the heat sink and raise that temperature relative to the very cold outside temperature and see what kind of voltage we can get. At the moment, this is still in development, and we expect to make some updates to make it significantly lighter and easier to handle, and also make it easier to fly so we can maintain our sub 12 pound payload limit. The other thing of interest to us is a flying Geiger counter. So obviously we're going to have different emissions during an eclipse, or we believe we will, than just during a standard day. So our theory was if we have a Geiger counter in the air that's recording data and we have one on the ground, we can compare the two and see what's going on in the upper atmosphere. Full disclosure, this is probably the payload I know the least about. So I'm sure it will have some of you guys will have questions and I may have to refer you to some of our team members of the work tomorrow. And our last payload of interest that we've been working on kind of inspired by a mix of the pterodactyl and some of and the uh, Occam's board and the vent control is kind of an all-in-one uh, PCB. So our idea with this, at least our primary one we plan to work on this semester is, can we have a GPS on board this unit that will allow us to autonomously vent? So can we write a program that says, if you hit this altitude, vent until this vertical speed drops? So lots of opportunities with this, and we have other um, plugs available. We also have the opportunity to run this over a 3.7 or a five volt battery to try and avoid some of those voltage regulator issues we talked about yesterday. So 
yeah, that's just kind of a sneak peek into what St. Francis has been doing. Um, thank you guys for being a part of our journey. Thank you guys for these meetings. It's good to be able to recognize some of the people on these calls. And we look forward to watching during the total solar eclipse. All right. Thank you. And again, you guys are just nailing these times here. So this is great. Um, any questions? I have a comment. <laughs> okay. I encourage, I encourage you to uh, see what Victor Hess did back in 1912. He got a Nobel Prize for it. Flying mm -hmm. Geiger counters during eclipses. I won't give away what happened, but uh, it turns out that someone has done that before. And I encourage you to look into what to expect. All right. Thank you. Also, feel free to reach out to uh, St. Catherine University in regards to uh, Geiger counters. We have a little bit of experience with this if you want some tips, suggestions, but take James' suggestion first. All right. There's a note from Angela. Keep flying Geiger counters in the solar maximum 2025. Lots of good ideas. Q, it looks like your your payload is getting heavier. Are you taking are you taking instruments out of your payload? Yeah, so we've had we've definitely had to play with the weight back and forth. Um, I think we've only flown that Geiger counter once empty just to make sure we could attach it to keep us below that 12 pound limit. So we're we're kind of seeing do we want to fly, you know, any extra stickers? Can we kind of play with what kind of batteries we're using? So we're trying to keep as much instrumentation as possible and certainly the Montana uh, deployments. So we're just seeing what we can do with the extra weight. Thank you. So Angela suggested, you know, you could put up another balloon. Um, I have a question. Your rope drop mechanism, has that worked? Have you ever used it? So we've flown it a couple times and both times it did not work, not because of the mechanical side of things, but because of the electrical. Um, the time it was over the power line, we suspect there was some sort of interference because it was on a high voltage power line. Um, and the next time we weren't able to get close enough to use it until about eight days later. So the batteries just ran out for the servo. So we're hoping we can use it in a successful way at some point. Yes, I recommend probably not dropping ropes from power lines and pulling on the ropes. Okay. Any other last minute questions? If not, again, thank you so much. Great presentation. All right. Thank you, guys.